So welcome to all of you to the Frederick Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. I assume that many of you are already aware of the center and have known your way down Bay State Road to find us here. This is a, a, an important event for us because it represents a confluence of streams of thought and streams of, streams of experience. Latin America, East Asia, China, themes about economic development, themes about where we're headed in terms of this engagement that affects not only Latin America, we could add Africa to the group, we could have South Asia to the group, we could add a whole range of geographic uh, interactions in which what China plans on doing, lays out in the five-year plan, is pretty fundamental to what's going to happen on a global scale. So I think this is a really good occasion. We are very, very much fully subscribed here in terms of your presence today, so welcome to all of you. My role here is to invite you to continue to join us in our discussions about global issues with perspectives on the future, and those global issues range from ecology to capital transfers, a whole range of things that you will see. And as you, I encourage you to visit our website often because it changes very often. Our whole goal is, design, is to design it in a way that you need to see what's coming up because it's not the same as what happened last week. So I invite you to visit us there and also physically here when we have events of this nature. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass, to pass it over to one of our key faculty fellows, one of our most active and distinguished colleagues, Kevin Gallagher, who's going to introduce the event of the day. And again, welcome to all of you to the Frederick Pardee uh, Center. And let me pass it to Kevin. Thanks, Jim. Uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for, for coming for this uh, interesting and collaborative event. Um, I want to really want to thank the Pardee Center for hosting this. But uh, this is, uh, I think this is the first uh, and hopefully not the last uh, uh, Pardee Center Latin American Studies Program and Boston University Center for the Study of Asia event uh, uh, in the history of Boston University, which has been around for a little while. So we're excited about bringing these uh, three different communities and, uh, and having them overlap. And hopefully, we'll, we'll be able to learn a lot from each other and, uh, and have an interesting conversation about uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about on our own, we can uh, talk about together. Uh, even though the three entities have not had um, uh, have not had a formal link like this. A lot of the folks in Latin American Studies, a lot of the folks in uh, BU Center for the Study of Asia have been very active with the Pardee Center. Uh, Joe Fusmith, who's here, who's the head of the um, uh, Boston University Center for the Study of Asia, uh, had a conference here two, two years ago on the future of China that uh, just yielded a, an, ex an excellent book by Cambridge University Press called China Today, China Tomorrow, Domestic Politics, Economy, and Society. Uh, this is available uh, on Amazon in paperback at an affordable price. Um, uh, last year, uh, the Party Center held a, an event called Latin America 2060. What do we think about uh, politics, economic development, and so forth in Latin America working uh, into the future with a number of experts both uh, here at the university and, uh, and across the hemisphere? And uh, published a nice report called Latin America 2060 Consolidation or Crisis. This one's even at more of an affordable price. You can walk away with one of these uh, free from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the party center today. Also, Susan Eckstein, who's uh, uh, the director of the Latin American Studies Program, uh, held a conference here on, in 2009 on how migrants impact their homelands. And that's a book that will be coming out soon as well. So we're, we're glad to formally tie these things together here at the Party Center and have a conversation about something that um, uh, people might find out that we're having a conversation about. Sure, there's events all over these universities about China's five-year plan. Everyone is talking about uh, China's five-year plan. What does it mean? How do you translate it? Are they going to really implement it and so forth? I should say that these China's five-year plans are, um, are actual matters of policy. It's not like the five-year plans that we hear in uh, presidential debates here and things like that uh, in the United States. The uh, China five-year plan, a lot goes into it. And uh, sometimes a lot comes out of it. Um, Interestingly, in Latin America, there is a lot of conversation about China's five-year plan. Uh, two, ten years ago, China was not very talked about in Latin America. You know, it was about the country's 10th or 11th most trading partner, hardly a diplomatic presence. There had been one uh, 50, 60 years beforehand, but, uh, but not, uh, it wasn't really even on the radar screen. 
Uh, by 2010, China is the number one or number two trading partner of just about every Latin American country, except for those countries that don't, uh, that don't recognize China in the, uh, in the United Nations. Um, and so for folks who are interested in Latin America, uh, the impacts of China's five-year plan on the region are something that is, uh, is, uh, everyone wants to know. And so we're really happy to uh, have Margaret Myers come here with us and share her thoughts about China's five-year plan and implications for Latin America. She's the director of the China and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington. It's got to be the, uh, the, the foremost think tank uh, in Washington on Latin American policy and U.S.-Latin American relations. It has six or seven ex-presidents on its board of directors all the time and, and is really uh, the cutting edge on, on a lot of issues related to Latin America. She did her graduate, wor uh, she, uh, did her, uh, graduate work at George Washington University and the John Hopkins University, Nanjing uh, University Center for Chinese American Studies. She's uh, worked extensively in the, in the U.S. government and now she's heading this uh, this working group at the Inter-American Dialogue. She'll, uh, she's, our, she's our main event tonight. She'll, uh, this afternoon, it's been a long day. Uh, <laughs> kids woke up at 5. The, uh, <laughs> for her, too. She took the shuttle from Washington. Um, she'll give a presentation for 25 minutes or so. And then we have Boston University's own Edward Cunningham, who, uh, for those of you who haven't met him, we're really excited to have him here. Uh, he's a political scientist in the Department of Geography and Environment. He's got a PhD from the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology. Uh, he's working on a really innovative project at uh, Harvard on uh, energy technology and innovation. He's an expert on the Chinese energy system and China, Chinese uh, energy and environmental politics in general. We're really happy to have him here at the university and, and especially uh, here with us. He'll provide some commentary after Margaret's presentation and then we'll open it up and we can collectively have a conversation about this stuff. Margaret. Thank you so much, Kevin, and, and thank you to the Party Center for hosting me as well. It's a, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, just initially, the, the dialogue, the Inter-American Dialogue, as Kevin mentioned, I, I've been working there for, for just under a year now, um, has been really fortunate to count Dr. Gallagher among, among the members of our China and Latin America Working Group, which we've had two sessions of now, and also to publish a new report by, by Kevin, by Amos Irwin and Catherine Koleski, who are here in the, in the front row on Chinese loans in Latin America, which has attracted considerable attention so far. So if you're at all interested in China and Latin America, I highly recommend that you, you take a look at that report. It's very cutting edge. You can find it on, on the Inter-American Dialogue website, but I'm sure also here at, here at BU. Um, I'm also delighted to have the opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Cunningham, who recently contributed some excellent analysis on, on Chinese energy-related energy decision-making um, to the Dialogue's China and Latin America Working Paper series. So, so thank you again for that. So the plan today is, is to talk a bit about China's 12 five-year plan, as, as Kevin mentioned, and what its many proposed social and economic reforms will mean for Latin America. And this is really no small feat. Um, it requires not only an in-depth analysis of the plan itself, um, but also predictions, very difficult predictions, regarding the extent to which the plan will be implemented, and then how you know, the various ways in which it will impact Latin America. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it's safe to say that nobody, um, with the exception perhaps of the nine members of China's elite Politburo Standing Committee, have any idea what's going to happen in China over the next five years. And with a political transition coming up, I think there's you know, probably tremendous, a, a tremendous degree of uncertainty even at the highest levels of the Communist Party. So all of that said, what I, what I hope to do today is to discuss three economic and social reforms that, that are not only major, of area, excuse me, major areas of focus within the plan itself, um, but, but which have the potential to impact Latin America, I think, in, in some way. And I'll, and I'll go through how, that, how, how I consider that. Um, and of course, the extent to which they will do so really remains to be seen. Uh, so first of all, a, a quick background. Let's see if I can, yep. A quick background on China's five-year plans for those who aren't <coughs> familiar. Uh, they were first initiated in 1953, uh, inspired by Soviet-style planning, and have since laid the foundation for such economic and, and social movements as the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and, and uh, the era of reform and opening up, uh, Geiger Kaifeng. Uh, the plans are initiated by China's Development and Reform Commission, um, and later considered by the Central Committee of the Communist Party, which generates a plan proposal. Uh, China's State Council then designates a wide variety of experts to, to review the proposal and eventually submits it to the, the uh, National People's Congress for approval. 
So this past March, the National People's Congress approved China's 12th version, the 12th five-year plan, which, make, which takes us through 2015, and like its predecessors, is is extensive, right? If you've ever had the pleasure of reading one of these things. Uh, page after page lays out the many, many social and economic uh, concerns that the Chinese government considers most relevant to, to, to growth and development. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, in Chinese it's called Sha Wu. Um, of the many reforms proposed within the 12th five-year plan, I'll take my, uh, my 20 minutes here to discuss the three that I see not only as, as the major focus of, of the plan itself, but as I mentioned, have the potential to impact Latin America in, in, in some way, or China's future engagement with Latin America, at least. Um, and these are, first of all, economic transformation from, from an investment and export-driven growth to consumption-driven growth. Second, uh, resource constraints and environmental degradation. And then third, industrial reform. And each of these topics is extremely broad and, and is addressed through, through a, a real slew of, of proposed policy solutions within the plan itself. Okay. So first is, is economic transformation. And um, by most all accounts, this is really the, the central feature of, of the 12th five-year plan. Um, in response to what China perceives as, as an evolving global dynamic, shaped by the global financial crisis, by fluctuations in global demand, by, by uncertainty with regard to Europe's fate, um, and so on, as well as an interest in, in promoting more sustainable growth in China, the 12th five-year plan is, is largely committed to what it calls strategic adjustment of the economic structure. Uh, it seeks new advantages in global competition and, most importantly, a fundamental shift in Chinese growth, um, or in the growth dynamic, from one characterized by an over-reliance on, mm -hmm. on export and investment to one driven by higher rates of, of uh, private consumption as a share of GDP. And consumption, as, as many of you may know, has hovered uh, in China has hovered around 30% for years, and this is very low in comparison to other G20 countries and, and even to other countries in, in East Asia. Um, and you can see on the chart here the, the red line, if I'm sorry if it's very small, but a marked decrease in household spending from 2000 to 2009. <coughs> um, so Chinese leaders have proposed to achieve this economic transformation through a variety of measures. Uh, and the most often cited include improvements to China's social welfare system, which you see at the top, um, income-related reforms, and then nationwide urbanization efforts. A weak social safety net in, in China has arguably led to high savings rates uh, in, in, for anticipated health care, education, and retirement expenses, as well as for purchasing houses, getting married, whatever other expenses uh, are anticipated. Uh, the five-year plan therefore proposes improvements to compulsory education offerings, uh, employment services, unemployment benefits, disability benefits, and, and migrant services to try and free up household savings and to generate higher rates of consumption. Um, if you take a look here, uh, these are some of the social welfare related reforms outlined in the plan along with certain goals to be achieved either on an annual basis or by 2015 and you can see it, it, there's really a wide range and some very ambitious goals. One in particular is, uh, uh, that, that's of interest always is this low income apartment housing or low income apartment buildings or low income housing, uh, 36 million units by 2015. Um, in terms of income, the plan also proposes minimum wage increases in a, of at least 13% per year um, across the board. It also proposes certain tax reforms intended to reduce the household tax burden, as well as revisions to the corporate uh, tax structure. And greater access to rural finance has also been discussed for years as a means of boosting uh, rural income. Anyone who's been to, to China in the past decade has a probably good sense of China's progress in terms of, of urbanization. Uh, you can see China's cities popping up everywhere and expanding um, remarkably just ac across the board, not only uh, on the East Coast, but now in the center of the country and even out West. Um, China's leaders have, d have focused on the development of urban areas for years as a driver of economic growth and a means of generating employment opportunities and higher income levels. 
The 12 five year plan includes um, a proposal to increase China's urbanization by another 4%, so that by 2015, 51.5% of the population will reside in urban areas. Um, it also proposes a series of massive projects to achieve this goal, many of which are, are underway across the country. And, and you hear about, uh, you know, these mega cities that are that are being built as sort of connections of or agglomerations of, of large cities in the northeast, in sort of the Chengdu area, Chongqing area, and, and out west near Lanzhou, um, across the entire country. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you can see a, a couple of infrastructure projects proposed to support nationwide urbanization, uh, specifically plans for national rail networks and, and a national expressway network here. So quite a bit of, of infrastructure development would, would um, accompany these urbanization plans. Second um, major focus of the plan, as I mentioned earlier, are efforts to, uh, to address China's resource constraints and environmental degradation. Uh, in 2011, China's environment minister, Zhou Shangxian, uh, stated that China's pollution issues and, and resource depletion threatened to choke the country's economic growth. And we've seen quite a bit of press coverage in Beijing uh, recently just uh, about sort of air quality, quite a bit more uh, just information about what air quality is doing to people's health and so on. So it's becoming an increasingly important issue. Um, and as a result of, of growing environmental and resource challenges in China, we've, we've seen a real marked increase in, in green initiatives in, in the 12 five-year plan. Uh, they include efforts to protect arable land, uh, to restore environmental health to rivers and lakes, reduce emissions, develop waste treatment facilities, imp implement uh, conservation measures, and, and combat climate change. And you know, there are pages upon pages describing the ways in which uh, China intends to do these things, or at least outlying the goals. Um, and increasingly, I think addressing these issues is, is very important to maintaining domestic stability. As we saw in 2011 in Dalian, there, there was a major protest about um, a chemical spill in the water supply there. And then there have been several other examples uh, across China of this as well. So it's of, of increasing uh, importance. The third major feature um, of the plan that, that I think will, in some way, have an influence on Latin America, excuse me, on Latin America is industrial reform, um, which essentially envisions China shifting away from low value added, uh, export oriented um, manufacturing. The plan includes proposals to restructure key industries, which I've mentioned there, nine key industries. Uh, promote strategic emerging industries, which are also listed. These are the ones that they, they highlight in the plan. And to develop China's service sector. Uh, China's leaders intend to boost the service sector's share of GDP by four percentage points over the next five years. Uh, small and medium-sized industries, or excuse me, um, enterprises, are also promoted in the 12 five-year plan as, primarily as job creators in urban areas. They propose several means of supporting SMEs in various cities. I hope that's big enough. So, <laughs> so uh, when determining how these three very broad and, and complex issues will, will impact Latin America, one must first consider the likelihood uh, they will be implemented at all and, and what this will mean for China. And, and Kevin's already discussed this. Um, very briefly. Uh, it, it's very difficult to determine which of the extensive challenges addressed in the 12 five year plan will be implemented by the Chinese government. Uh, most are extraordinarily complex, and many would require a degree of consensus among China's various political interests that hasn't yet been clearly attained. Um, Abandoning investment-centered growth, for example, uh, would be a massive undertaking and one likely opposed by, by certain banks, by the Ministry of Finance, and by other vested interests in China. Uh, fixed asset investment has remained high as China enters its, its 12th five-year period and despite calls for economic rebalancing, shows few signs of slowing over the next five years. Um, Implementation of central government originated policies at the local level is yet another challenge. Anyone who studies China knows that. Um, and has, this has you know, been the case historically uh, in China, where, where so that you have 
any number of, of Chinese sayings kind of explaining the phenomenon, right? You have Shang Gao Huang Di Yuan, the, you know, the emperor, the mountains are higher and the emperor is far away. You know, things can be implemented in Beijing or created in Beijing, but it's not so easy to implement them far away. Or Shang Yu Zheng Si, Xia Yu Dui Si, you know, these ones that everybody kind of knows, explaining how hard it is to really implement um, these, these policies. Um, Rapid uh, urbanization, another major feature of the plan, means extensive planning regarding the carrying ability of cities, um, urban works, and so on. And it could also mean an increase in land appropriation conflicts, which have been on the rise in, in recent years and which really uh, you know, threaten stability. Um, China will need to make dramatic improvements in terms of innovation to achieve the upgrading proposed in its industrial plan. And, and there's no real consensus regarding the extent to which it will be able to do this. Um, Balanced income growth is also a challenge. The rural, the rural urban gap remains uh, expansive. Environmental progress will also be extremely difficult to achieve, and, as was the case in the 11th five-year plan. Um, meanwhile, China's arable land is shrinking. Uh, its remaining land is often of, of very poor quality. Um, and food security is really of, of increasing concern to China's leadership. I've been seeing quite a bit more talk of this in, in Chinese media of late. Um, so there's really very little certainty regarding progress over the, over the next few years, not to mention the possibility of an economic hard landing in China or of a Eurozone crisis. So you know, a number of factors could play in. But I still think it's good to begin thinking about implications of China's domestic development, um, not only for Latin America, but for the you know, various regions in which China is engaging at the moment. This, hopefully you've had time to kind of take it in. I'm sorry for all the text. Um, China issued a policy paper in 2008 uh, detailing its intended range of interactions with Latin America. And this is an extremely condensed version of that policy paper. The paper itself is you know, something like 15 pages long. Um, and looking back now, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we, we've indeed seen evidence of nearly all of the forms of political, economic, cultural, and, and security-related um, interactions highlighted in this policy paper. There, there is evidence of China sort of engaging in all of these activities in Latin America at this point, which I wouldn't have thought probably back in 2008. Um, and this is you know, a, a very unscientific process, so I apologize in advance for that. But the areas highlighted in green um, are those I see as likely to be influenced in some, in some way right, by domestic challenges and policy solutions that I've, that I've just mentioned. Um, and just to, to talk a little bit about some of these areas in green, <clears throat> First of all, trade. Uh, trade is really the foundation of, of the China-Latin America relationship. It, it, it has been since you know, the early to mid-2000s and continues to be. Uh, certain countries in Latin America stand to be affected um, rather extensively by, by fluctuations in Chinese demand that could result from economic realignment. Or alternatively, uh, could be affected by, by sustained demand for construction-related commodities associated with massive urbanization and industrialization efforts. So uh, you know, whichever way China goes, uh, trade, trade will be influenced and, and will continue to be kind of a driving factor in the relationship. Um, agricultural cooperation. Um, China's growing food security issues, despite you know, tremendous interest in, in at least articulated in the plan with regard to environmental progress. Uh, there will be plenty of impediments to progress, and I think that food security is going to remain a, a really critical issue for China in the next few years. Um, I think these issues will very likely promote additional agricultural cooperation in Latin America, and we've already seen some examples of this um, in terms of you know, exchanges on seed science, uh, agricultural techniques, and biotech, um, these, these examples are increasingly common throughout the entire region, ranging from Mexico down to, to Argentina. Um, third, infrastructure construction. China-led infrastructure construction, I think, is likely to continue largely in exchange for natural resources. And, and Kevin's paper explains this very well, if, you, if you're interested in, in, in that at all. Uh, by most all accounts, significant quantities of petroleum, iron ore, and copper will be needed for urbanization purposes and industrial development, especially if China pursues the massive undertakings that is outlined in its five-year plan. But even a fraction of that would require qu quite a bit in the way of, of uh, natural resources. 
um, tourism cooperation, I think, uh, might also expand uh, as a result of, of some of the, the elements of China's five-year plan, assuming they are implemented and they are successful. Uh, should China achieve higher income levels and therefore expand its middle class, um, you're going to have more Chinese interested in, in traveling abroad. And uh, expansion of the service sector would involve also expansion of the tourism sector, uh, according to the five-year plan. So that's another area where cooperation might expand a little bit. Um, cooperation, in terms of cooperation in science, technology, and education, we've already been seeing some evidence of this between China and Brazil regarding renewable energy. Uh, and China faces energy and, and as China faces its energy and resource related challenges, this sort of cooperation I think is really likely to expand. Brazil and China have been doing some really interesting work on um, bamboo <coughs> technology and other sort of, of course, uh, you know, sugarcane related energy. But uh, bamboo has, has been kind of the, the leading force of some of their cooperation lately. Uh, in terms of cooperation in environmental protection and in combating climate change, the plan itself um, mentions these, these factors, um, as well as work on renminbi internationalization and enhanced aid efforts in, in developing countries and sectors where China hasn't you know, originally been very active, things like education, health, social issues. China tends to focus more on infrastructure development uh, and on accessing energy resources and other commodities. Um, yes, is that, did I touch all of them? Yeah, I think that that's the, and I, you know, I, I could easily see China in many ways expanding its cooperation in these other areas as well, in many of these other areas as well. But in terms of the, the, the three sort of critical elements of the plan that I've mentioned, these, these are areas where I see um, expansion in many ways and deepening of engagement. And uh, yeah, I think I'll conclude on that. I think I've done my 25 minutes. Uh, <coughs> I wasn't looking. But, uh, <laughs> short and sharp. Ed Edward Cunningham, some comments. Yeah. So thanks, thanks to Margaret for, that, uh, for those comments, and also uh, for her great work putting together different groups of people, uh, particularly uh, the, the Latin American watchers and the China watchers, <coughs> most recently uh, in the work that you're doing in DC on these issues. So, I think what I'll do maybe is uh, just react, uh, sort of provide some comments, uh, maybe also to put some of the, uh, some context um, around the issues of, of how or what the bridges are um, that at least I see moving forward uh, between China and, and the world, uh, in this case uh, a region, uh, a Latin America. Um, what I find quite interesting, and I agree with Margaret, is that we, we don't really know, of course, uh, the extent to which this in some ways quite bottom-up constructed five-year plan, as most of them are, um, how it will be employed uh, in the sense that it, it's always a, a bit of a, of a debate internally and also a debate among vested interests, the extent to which, of course, we're going to see um, a meshing between local interests around China and central interests, but even the the interests of different entities within the central government. Um, so I think she's right to be cautious in terms of uh, projecting forward what we think the, the impact will be. But I think what we can be specific about is um, at least three, three trends that, um, that we, that there's quite a lot has been written about them and I think that are going to be fairly durable uh, moving forward that very much stem from uh, the issues that Margaret just raised. One is resource constraints, as she, as she highlighted. So what I find quite interesting is the incredible consensus for a country that, like many places, does not often have consensus, particularly at the leadership level regarding the, um, the imminent challenges of resource constraints. So resource constraint is a discussion and debate that's been occurring in China for decades. The past decade, it's heightened. Uh, it's been heightened, particularly given the incredible growth after uh, China's accession to the WTO and the industrialization that occurred in China and the knock-on effect on um, the use of domestic resources. So about a decade ago, the, the narrative was, was for energy was very similar to the narrative for grain, for other uh, strategic resources within China, where self-sufficiency was continually uh, focused upon as, uh, and there was a whole series of policies that were in place, particularly in terms of the backbone of China's energy structure, coal, in which it, there were incentives to export um, and there were many obstacles to import. One of the things that's fascinating to me um, over time 
is as the resource constraint challenges we have become much more clear with this incredible ramp up of, of uh, particularly of coal, right, where, where coal is 80, 82% of power produced, over 70% of primary energy consumed, where you see specific metrics over and over again, both within government documents and in the media being referenced. Refer metrics such as um, when you move from a billion tons, the size of the U.S. coal market, to three billion tons in under two, two decades, right? When, you, when one country does that much and moves that much investment, in a, particularly in terms of extracting its resources, very critical metrics change very rapidly. So you have, for example, within China, the reserves to production ratio that used to be well over 70 years, right, in terms of how much is in the ground given technology and current pricing to what's being produced, going from over 70 years to now just under 30 years, right, so having in about a decade. Right. So that is a real metric. That's a metric that politicians, uh, whether they're elected or not, that are stewards of that, those assets owned by the state get very concerned over because the implication, of course, is that in another 10 years, given these rates, that number would be zero, right? even given slight technology increases and price increases. That, is, that had incredible political currency, those types of shifts. That has led to a whole series of policies that have in, 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 a, in a fairly organized way, systematic way, have fundamentally redefined the way that those resources um, are marshaled, and in fact, the way that those resources um, interact uh, with the outside world. To the extent now that China has really thrown the entire trading world off um, because it went from being the largest exporter of coal, as an example, to being the largest importer last month, right? So enormous ahistorical trend shift there in, in the period of two years. Um, and moving forward, interestingly enough, having done that now, ha the, a, a, there's, there's a return now, uh, a positive return in terms of security, at least defined by a lot of the regulators, because what China is doing is by creating such an enormous demand through imports, it's transforming what's a very thinly traded market where you have about 16-17% about of any coal consumed crosses a border versus 66-67% for oil, right? Very thinly, very thinly traded, very volatile to a, a market now in which China is itself, by only moving 1 or 2%, is actually shifting to 14, 15, even 20%, the volume traded. And you can start seeing that by doing that, in, in many ways, China is, is creating a more liquid, a more, a more deeply traded market over time as it begins to incrementally increase those imports, right? So there's an interesting um, feedback loop that in many ways also moving forward um, reinforces this idea of attempting to shift away from self-sufficiency at all costs to a, a model in which um, these resources are being imported in order to arrest that massive decline in terms of reserves production. So that's one is re resource constraints. And again, when you're dealing with a country that has reserves of oil, half that of the United States, reserves of gas, a quarter of the United States, and uh, coal, about half the United States, um, it, it's, a, it's a considerable a considerable issue. So I find, so number one, that, I think that's a durable, a durable shift. Um, the second is, as Margaret's saying, the rise, more, more broadly, just rise in domestic prices, right, in terms of inputs, price of inputs. Uh, whether that's by policy, right, through fiat, by increasing the minimum wage in order to deal with social welfare uh, increases, uh, try to drive social welfare increases, whether it's simply uh, provision of public goods and services, more provision of public goods and services, also to deal with social welfare increases in order to uh, reinforce consumption. That translates into, through policy, higher prices on the input side. It also, of course, as we know, as China's coastal areas uh, continue to develop, there's also economic reality, which is that that, um, that demand-chasing supply, particularly for skilled labor, increasingly, uh, is driving up prices in terms of economics, right? So we have higher prices. And the last is just pressure, putting those two together, pressure to move up the value chain. And so you have the third where you have uh, particularly the state or enterprises that are, in, that are consolidating in many industries now that are attempting to try to move out of the lower uh, value added, right? Razor thin margin, um, uh, often um, midstream to downstream in certain industries. Those industries, those uh, rather those activities in the global production network, and are trying to move 
either upstream, depending on the industry, or downstream, uh, to be able to capture more value. So that means that those corporations increasingly are looking abroad because one of the fastest ways you can, you can transform, of course, is by acquiring, right? acquiring the knowledge, acquiring the people, uh, even acquiring new, new markets uh, at the same time. So if you put those three together, what interests me most about Latin America, at least, and other regions as well, is that you have the major interface for the Latin Americans, um, particularly for the people of the countries, really not the government, right? not the Chinese government, but Chinese corporations that are themselves, um, because of these three interrelated pressures, are moving quite rapidly and fairly systematically, uh, at least in terms of their industries, abroad. And they're doing it in a way um, that is uh, trying to both fulfill some of these resource constraint um, pressures, uh, number one, uh, at least in terms of the, the, the rhetoric uh, and, and their interface with their own government, Two, they're rapidly trying to move money out of China, given the higher input prices that they're facing within China and the consolidation of the market. And then three, uh, attempting to move up the value chain by acquiring a, a strategic assets, uh, not just assets in terms of energy, but also in corporate, uh, in, in terms of their, uh, the corporate landscape. And so that's what I find so interesting, because then you get a question of really, the, not the, almost the five-year plan, but really corporate governance in China and how that reform really affects the nature of the interface and therefore the sustainability of that, those activities. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Ed. What I'll, what I'll do uh, before we op open up for question and answer, since we've been talking so much about the future, I'll talk a little bit about the past to give us a little co uh, context for our, for our conversation because <clears throat> depending upon who you talk to uh, over the past five to ten years, China has been very, very good to Latin America or very, very bad. It depends upon where you sit. Uh, uh, on a number of different levels, but just to give you some of the some of the hard facts, is that for the South, the many of the South American countries <clears throat> that have grown very fast since since the year 2000, a lot of it has to do with China. It has to do with Chinese demand for primary commodities, uh, soybeans, oil, beef, uh, iron ore are the core ones. So we're talking about Brazil, Argentina, uh, lesser extent Bolivia. Uh, Peru and Chile have all seen significant growth that has been powered by exporting to China. And because China's caused scarcity in these markets, the prices for those commodities have gone up in general. So Brazil is getting a better price for its copper, for its uh, iron, uh, when it sells to Australia and so forth. And the, the commodity contribution to economic growth is what drove economic growth in South America uh, during, uh, during, uh, during the period up until the boom. Um, so from an economic growth perspective, China has played a very positive role in South America uh, over the past 10 years, or at least up until the financial crisis. And some innovative governments like Chile and, uh, and Brazil were able to use some of that growth to redistribute it and reduce inequality and, and improve poverty through innovation, innovative programs. If you sit in uh, Mexico and Central America, China has been a, a, different, uh, a different story because those countries don't have significant comparative advantages in natural resources that Chinese demand. And instead, those countries have traditionally tried to build their economies on having export-led agriculture and low-skilled work, textiles industries, electronics industries, and autos. And they've had a real hard time over the past 10 years competing with the Chinese in the United States market and in European markets. Um, and so those countries have, uh, have not been as excited about the relationship with China and have actually been very protectionist, uh, taking China to the WTO in terms of anti-dumping suits and trying to put up uh, uh, tariffs on their own and generally trying to protect these industries, the textiles industry in Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> if you remember, the last presidential campaign uh, was talked about all the time. Um, because all the textiles jobs were supposedly left the United States and went to Mexico, well, you can't find many of them in Mexico uh, anymore because they're, because they're in China. Um, if you think about those two trends and, and move, into the, uh, move into the next five years, <clears throat> it really depends on the commodities. If, if they do shift towards a more consumption-based, there might be a different basket of commodities that the Chinese will have, um, assuming that, uh, that the export mix doesn't change. Uh, or, or changes along with it. But I think for the South Americans, <clears throat> you are going to see a significant demand in primary commodities from China, as, as Edward said and, and Margaret notes. Um, and actually, uh, I think you'll see a short-term boon in Central America and Mexico, because regardless of whether or not the uh, five-year plan is implemented, that the Chinese exchange rate is appreciating and Chinese wages are increasing. 
and the margin is so close relative to an electronics worker in Mexico or, an, or a, a textiles worker in Central America that those tiny changes will allow Central America and Mexico to export more to the United States. So in the short term, I see over the five years these things uh, being <clears throat> relatively um, uh, continuing the positive that we've received in South America and um, maybe reversing some of the negative trends that we've seen in Mexico and Central America. <clears throat> However, I would argue over the medium and long term, both of those trends are really bad for the region. That uh, we all know <clears throat> that uh, commodity-led growth is something that Latin America spent 200 years trying to move away from. And <clears throat> if you think of this triangle, excuse me, <clears throat> this triangle of incentives where you have Chinese economic demand for primary commodities, okay, um, and all sorts of investment in primary commodities for us from Latin American co commodities moving to China. At the same time, you have Chinese outcompeting your, your manufacturing in global markets and in domestic markets. That can cause a tug, to, a tug towards deindustrialization. And we know that the more diversified an economy is, the better it grows. And so if this, uh, and we are, we're seeing signs of this in, in Brazil already, if we see deindustrialization, it can have real significant impacts on, on long-run growth. And same with Mexico and Central America. I, some of us argued that <clears throat> the fact that they were losing out to China for the past five years would, tell, would teach them to sort of try to move up the value chain like China has. They've always tried to hitch their hitch themselves to the U.S. market by being the low-wage assembly plants for the United States, and no country can grow on that either. And so I think uh, over the next five years, based on the past five years' experience, uh, we'll continue to see good growth prospects in terms of exports to commodities uh, to China for the South Americans, and actually better, uh, a better opportunity for Central America and Mexico selling to the United States. However, the medium and longer term things are uh, the incentives are going in the wrong way for long run development, which is what we think about here at the Party Center. So with all this uh, context and, and presentation, let's, uh, let's have a conversation. We have all sorts of interesting people from Latin American Studies, from the BU Center for the Study of Asia, and the uh, party regulars. So uh, let's party. Uh, well, I'll take a handful. <coughs> no pun intended. I'll take a few questions. Withdraw uh, that last statement. I'll take a handful of questions, and then um, and we can uh, Margaret and, and Edward can answer them. So Susan and Min. And Please use the microphone for the video. Yes, and since we have all these different communities that are uh, getting together today, please introduce yourself. Uh, tell us who you are. Susan Eckstein, um, International Relations, uh, Director of the Latin American Studies Program, and thank you, Kevin, for organizing this. Um, I really want to pick up on where you left off, Kevin, but throwing it out to other speakers. And um, I, you know, as a Latin Americanist, we've long studied, uh, rightly or wrongly, about the negative effects of uh, external dependencies, such as the impact of the United States on Latin American countries. So I really wonder if there uh, is more, are more ways to expand on what might be some of the negative effects of Chinese, China's uh, increasing dominance in Latin America. Maybe none, but uh, you know, I just think it's an, you know you hinted at a few issues, but I'm wondering social consequences, et cetera, that might come out of it. In the front. Uh, well, thank you for the three of you for your nice talk. And uh, my name is Ming Ye. I'm assistant professor in international relations. I teach on China, uh, China India, and now I'm hoping to do work on China's investments in the in developing countries. Um, so I have uh, in my own research, I generated two questions for each of the speaker. Uh, Margaret, um, so in my interviews of Chinese companies who want to invest in Latin America, well, that interview was done in uh, two years ago in Shanghai. Uh, but they, they, they all reported that the, uh, the local governments and the public re reception of their products or their uh, in, uh, factories were not very uh, good. 
um, uh, the the in terms of consumers, mainly they were they they prefer Western products over the Chinese products in terms of public. When they uh, uh, attempted to set up factories, then the local governments often put together uh, several barriers, and sometimes they cancelled their plans uh, uh, unilaterally. Uh, so I I want um, because you mentioned that nowadays it seems to uh, to be the case that Latin Americans receive the Chinese investors better. Uh, how about the manufacturing ones instead of the uh, commodity uh, you know, uh, uh, investors? Uh, to add, uh, I really like your comments on the Chinese, the resource constraints. But do, do, don't you think the constraints was also contributed by the state? Uh, the, uh, you mentioned the corporate behaviors. One thing is that uh, companies in China, uh, they were very powerful. and. Actually, that relates to both of you when you talk about investment-driven uh, growth in China. Investment were not about, was not done mainly by the state, but by the companies, the big companies. Um, the, I, I, uh, how how they were their invest interests were were to have high commodity in, uh, price in China and uh, while buying more and more overseas. I'll just give you a couple examples I encountered in my own research. Uh, for instance, if uh, uh, private companies they acquired uh, iron ore or, or resources somewhere, they couldn't import back to China because they, the, the state or the SOE, they monopolize the gate. Um, so do, do you see how this is a political actually is preventing China to meet its its goal uh, or in your in encounter with the Chinese bureaucrats do they talk about liberalizing the the market a little bit more mm -hmm. maybe it's too much state rather than too little state mm -hmm. and uh, in the front row here thanks I'm Amos Irwin I'm a second year student at the Fletcher School uh, up in Medford. And uh, I have a question about. I don't know how you pronounce that. Metha. Right? <laughs> Sorry. All right. I have a question about um, how the state owned enterprises may react to this, to this five year plan. Because it seems like there, there are a couple of options. Um, on the one hand, as, as you mentioned, they have sort of a lock on the imports of, of resources. And so with the resource scarcity, it seems like the state-owned enterprises will have a very large role in that area. Um, at the same time, they're responsible for a lot of fixed asset investment. And if China's trying to reduce that, that will affect the, the state-owned enterprises. Um, and, and so, as Margaret mentioned, that could uh, make it difficult to implement that, that goal. Um, but at the same time, there, there's a new need, or they're, they're trying to build up these new uh, infrastructure resources and, and trying to build up a certain portion of new industries, new high-value industries. And so I'm wondering to what extent uh, China's SOEs will, will be able to get into those new industries versus to what extent they'll be trying to block changes to the old industries, whether they're going to be able to get on board the new five-year plan or be left behind and, and try to drag their feet. Thank you, folks. Get some responses from the chair. Um, first of all, with regard to, if I could just, I think, Kevin, you might be better equipped to ask, answer the negative effects uh, question. I can go into it a little bit. But um, with regard to, it, it is very, very important to look at these, uh, these companies going abroad. Because as Kevin mentioned, they are, they are leading, they are the leading for us here in, in China's engagement in Latin America, they are you know, on the front lines of the going out strategy. So really, the way they engage is the way China is, is engaging Latin America. Um, and they've, in many cases, had tremendous success, and in many cases, also failed. And that, that's been the case for various reasons. Um, one, I've done some interviews with, with companies in, in China as well. Uh, regarding their experiences. And it's changed very significantly over the past, or the sorts of things that I hear have changed very significantly over the past you know, five or so years. When I first started interviewing these companies, and it ranged from you know, huge SOEs to, to very small you know, SMEs and, and their experiences as well. And uh, 
they were asking questions like, you know, what is the weather like in, in Brazil? And who's the president of, you know, Argentina? The very basic question, no real understanding of the region whatsoever at all. Sound like and, Americans. It sounds like yeah. Americans. <laughs> but, you know, usually you would. Uh, so they, uh, you know, there, there was really, really no understanding of the region. It, they said, you know, we are different culturally. We are different linguistically, and we are different geographically. I mean, we are so they're the two farthest regions, you know, from, from one another in the entire world. So uh, this was a major factor. Now you see a little bit of a change. Uh, there have been several countries. One, one example is Jack uh, Cars in Brazil has been doing a very good job of, of sort of learning about the Brazilian market, and as a result has had uh, some, some really good success uh, in selling its cars there. What it did was to advertise on, um, it hired a, a, a Brazilian PR firm, which is first of all a really good idea and something that Chinese firms have been resistant to. Um, and then did all of its advertising on the, the most famous uh, Brazilian sort of talk show, um, I guess, in, I think it was in Rio. And you know, it caught on. And they've been selling a lot of cars as a result. So that's one major success story and a, an example of evolution, of, of thinking and an evolution of approach. Um, there are still major SOEs or just various firms that prefer to, direct, to engage directly with with you know leaders in, in certain ALBA countries, you you, you think you know Morales, uh, Chavez, Correa, um, because it's an easy way in. Uh, you make this connection, and then everything is kind of set for you. But it's not necessarily the most sustainable model, and it's not necessarily going to mean that your interests are going to be respected in the long term. So, uh, yeah, there, there are various approaches, and you still see a wide, wide variety. But I think these firms are learning quite a bit at this point. And, and one, one more point on that is that what we see now um, in the China Development Bank, which is what um, the, the Kevin Saper uh, is, addresses it in some form, um, and uh, it, various other large SOEs are establishing their own think tanks. Um, to study Latin America, but also every other region in the world where they are engaged, uh, and this much of this is a result of you know crises that they've had in uh, with regard to investments <coughs> in Burma, in Libya, uh, and elsewhere. And they see that without understanding uh, the ways in which these countries work, uh, the the history, the culture, the language, that they're setting themselves up for failure, and it's not a long-term solution. So uh, this is something this sort of risk mitigation. Uh, more of an understanding before going into into these countries is, is increasingly important to not only to China's investors but also to its firms, uh, and it's also a component of the 12 five-year plan. They have a couple sentences on that in there. Um, SOEs, uh, yeah, I think they're set up. I mean, the largest energy-related SOEs and, and uh, resource-related SOEs are, are set up to, to continue operating, and they've already established kind of a foothold in many countries in Latin America and will continue to. To be there, what, what is um, going to be interesting is if China implements the sorts of financial reforms in terms of uh, interest rate liberalization, exchange rate liberalization that it, that it says it's going to in, in the five-year plan. I don't think that's going to happen over the course of five years. But if it does, that will affect you know the pot of money that the SOEs has to deal with. So that's another another factor uh, to keep in mind. Um, the five-year plan also mentions SOE reform in, in um, the context of the going out strategy. So right now, what China's realizing is that a lot of its firms, whether they're big ones or small ones, are kind of going willy-nilly into the region without much of a coordinated strategy, despite you know, there being a going out strategy. strategy it's not extremely comprehensive. So uh, the, there have been several articles. Um, and also, as I mentioned in the five-year plan, there's an attempt to to really coordinate everything that the, um, the SOEs are doing to establish more concrete gu guidelines and, and rules for operation so as to avoid any sort of uh, bad PR, as we've seen in, se in several cases in, in Latin America and especially in Africa, um, and to make sure that, that everybody is being monitored appropriately. Right now, the, the SOEs um, or just firms operating abroad report back to a wide variety of, of government agencies. and. Uh, it's it's kind of it's very sort of horizontal. It's very flat the reporting system. So there's not a lot of uh, of coordination and there's not a lot of communication. I don't think between them. So a few things to keep in mind. 
I'll talk about the, some of the um, uh, what what Susan characterizes as negative things. I don't know if there's necessarily negative, but that it's really changed a lot of the social and political conversation in the region for, for a number of reasons. Uh, and I'd say that the place where it's all happening is, is a place like Brazil, because Brazil has a, a big industrial cities and a big industrial capitalist class and big, uh, uh, big huge uh, industrial employment, uh, all the way you know, from the bottom to the top of the, uh, of the value chain. And so uh, it also has all these commodities that are doing, that are selling so well to the Chinese. They also have all this oil and all this iron ore and all these soybeans that the Chinese are wanting to invest in and are investing in uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars in, into the region. So they're, they're, they're uh, part of all of it. And so on, one, on the one hand, you have the industrial capitalists and the unions and workers are uh, uh, very antagonistic towards China, really pushing the government to put in protection, to increase industrial policy, to try to compete with the Chinese, uh, and are, are quite concerned. Uh, but then you have the commodity sector, where they really like things uh, where they are, although that has changed a little bit now that the Brazil is letting foreign investment in. When uh, Vale, uh, Brazil's biggest uh, uh, iron exporter, was exporting all this stuff to China, they were, they, it was great. But now that they might have to compete with Chinese iron ore companies on their own soil, there that's changed the political economy there. Uh, where all the action is in the commodities, and that's out in the uh, rural areas of, of uh, Brazil, where no workers are, and there's no real job benefits. Uh, in addition, most of the work that comes uh, is in the form of Chinese employment. And so there are lots of indigenous uh, concerns where um, in the countryside, you'll get a big new Chinese plant, which the country's all excited about. It doesn't really bring on unemployment. A lot of the linkages are very thin to begin with in a sector like that. Um, and then you have indigenous folks who have been there for 20,000 years without any land title that all of a sudden are shocked that there's this big, huge uh, edifice in the, in the middle of their, of their area. And so they're in places like Peru, there's been real significant uh, clashes over environment, over land rights. Uh, and uh, over the whole social political structure, so it's really changing the you know a conversation. That's why this this five year plan is something that people are talking about there uh, all the time, and that speaks a little bit to the you know how you define success. Is I think that many of the Chinese firms in China, they, you know, these are the China's national champions, and so there the the whole point was to try to get them strong, and so they wouldn't have many barriers when they were locating at home. And then they move to another country and they think, hey, we can just set up a big, huge thing and drill a hole in the ground and tell the people who have been moving for 20, 000, living somewhere for 20,000 years to move over here. And when the hole's empty, we'll, uh, we can move on. And uh, these countries have, uh, we, you know, Latin American as we criticize the institutions that the region has uh, more often than we praise them, but they do require environmental impact statements for uh, all new projects. Uh, they do have uh, laws about employment uh, and tied aid and things like that. And so uh, countries like Brazil have actually taken a, uh, taken a piece out of the China playbook in terms of foreign investment. And they want, when a foreign firm comes, just like the Chinese do, they want to have a research and development plant there. They want to have the firm have to buy inputs from Brazilian firms, not just import them all from China. And so China sees that as, oh, you know, that's, those, are, those are barriers, environmental impact statements, local content rules, uh, and uh, that's, you know, that's, that's a country like Brazil trying to make sure that the investment's quality rather than quantity. Uh, a place like Mexico, they don't care. They'll take anything that they can get. You can pollute. You can do anything to their workers. They're, they're not into quality foreign investment, but they're a different story. Hmm. Uh, I guess I'll just quickly then, so to Susan's question, um, uh, I would just reiterate what Kevin said originally, which is that, so I spend a lot of my time now mostly in places like Indonesia, uh, Mongolia, um, Myanmar next week, right, where you're seeing on the, at least on the Asia side, um, these, these nations, these economies that are uh, very much going down the Dutch disease road, right? So there's no question about it. If you, if you look and you, and you either discuss with the ministers or look at the data, you'll see very much the, the, this de the, the movement of investment away from manufacturing, right, into directly into uh, resource extraction, right? So that is clearly, at least in those three places where I spend a lot of my time, clearly happening and of enormous concern, at least to the local um, politicians. Um, some of the central politicians, interestingly, central government politicians, 
interestingly seem to be shifting, and I and I uh, I do not track the money flow on this, but this gets to your sort of so that's a long term economics issue. Sort of short term pol politics issue is, it seems that, and a lot of the SOEs will admit to the fact that they also are funneling a lot of funds now and getting into the game of, of domestic politics abroad, like the U.S. has done, you know, for well over a century. So, so they are perhaps some of the shift in terms of central governments pulling away and being less concerned is related to that. I'm not sure, but I would suspect that that's a short-term political issue, is the extent to which Chinese funding is shifting the views of politicians in the short term. So that's sort of a quick thought on that. But I, I'm really, I, I think Kevin's exactly right. It's real, the resource, the Dutch disease issue. Um, and then just in terms of Min's question, so I guess it, the way I view it is um, so you're too much state. So yes, in, in, in some ways, yes. Um, but what I'm seeing is resource constraint, right? What's happening is a bottom-up economic and a political uh, top-down, two forces, right? Bottom-up economic is these corporations, they're not necessarily, I'm not saying it's for, they're somehow in fulfilling these import needs, right, themselves uh, directly. Purposively, what I'm just saying is that what's happening is they are dealing in an environment where all these input prices are rising rapidly, and historically, it was actually difficult for them to import because there were import license constraints, and there were all these price incentives for you to export. So what's happened, and this happened in oil, right? It happened in oil in the mid '90s. Now it's happening in coal. Is as the input prices rise, these companies create a lot of uh, pressure. Right, where they want to, all of a sudden there's a huge arbitrage opportunities where now instead of them, uh, f for them to, even for uh, power plant producers, right, to be able to burn coal, they'd rather, they'd much rather have both security of supply of Australia and Indonesia and also the quality assurance and also lower pricing now from outside China. That was very difficult before. What's now, what's occurred top down are two things. One is a major shift to D dismantle those barriers and to be able to encourage those flows. Um, number one, why? Largely because of the shift in terms of focus on reserves to pr uh, production ratio, for example, and on the coal side, but even in terms of oil, seeing that there, there are significant ceilings in terms of the ability to increase efficiency with which oil is extracted, right? So, what's, so what you're seeing is, number one, they're shifting all of these policies. Number two, in terms of import license restrictions, pricing um, biases to export. But the other one is they're following very much the oil road in other areas. So you have coal strategic reserves that are two massive reserves that have already been set up uh, in Shandong province, right? So you're seeing that beginning where this, this what they call protective resource policy is starting to take shape. Um, so that's, at least to me, what, what is so interesting is it's not necessarily that one would expect um, uh, uh, ton for ton or pound for pound, that what's happening outside China is all coming back to China. But what's clearly happening is increasingly that's the case, right? So now we're going from, again, back to coal, zero imports to almost 300 million tons of imports this year, right? I mean, that, that's enormous shift. Now it's, that's almost, that's about, what is that, 9% of China's total consumption. So, we, it, so your bigger question, liberalizing? Yes, absolutely. So, liber so what does that mean? Liberalizing policies, that's happening. China becoming more engaged with the global economy, it's happening. China becoming more exposed to uh, imports, it's happening. And I, what I'm saying is that it's also reinforcing a, a uh, increasing comfort, I think, with that. Because in some ways, the more you're engaged, particularly in a volatile, thinly traded market, the more you're making it more predictable and the more you're making it traded and, and liquid. You see what I'm saying? And so that volatility is taken out. Uh, so. The larger player they become, the more market shaper they can become. And then the last point, I think, is SOEs, uh, yes. So I think it depends on the sector. So if you look at sectors in which they're, they're growing rapidly, um, so if it's looking at, for example, renewables, uh, the, the, the major SOEs are directly involved with the policies that have been uh, established um, in order to dominate in terms of their market share. So just one example is look at wind, right? In the end, when you look at the actual regulations um, through the Ministry of Industry Information Technology that set up the barriers to entry and the NDRC that also set the barriers to entry in terms of wind farms, you'll see very clearly, and if you look and, and track where those standards came from, they came directly from uh, CESA, so the State Owned Asset Supervision Commission's uh, work group uh, on wind that was directly, uh, that you look at the people who were on that committee, and they were all from the, the big five power producers um, and uh, two of the subsidiaries, and it's quite clear. 
you ask a uh, one of the 80, for example, like 84 other wind turbine producers that are in China, that are Chinese, what's your biggest problem? They'll say, we can't even bid into because of the, the, the standards in terms of size, both running time, size of the turbine, uh, financial disposition. We can't even bid into the, the, the next round uh, of wind concessions, right? Because they've been defined out. Can I, can I respond to Susan's question as well, just add one point? Um, just to give you a, a sense of comparison, um, in terms of, of the danger of, of, of Chinese investment or, or trade with Latin America and, and uh, primarization and all these sorts of deindustrialization concerns and everything else. Um, the World Bank did a, did a report called Lack um, Long-Term Growth Prospects Made in China uh, a few months ago and, and did a really fascinating analysis uh, comparing the relationship between Japan and the Asian tigers um, during, during their growth period and then that, with that of China and Latin America. And they discovered that you know, the composition of trade was fairly similar except for the fact that Japan's uh, trade with East Asian tigers involved quite a bit more of, of intra-industry trade uh, and also of technology transfer, allowing for uh, you know, higher just te technology acquisition, um, a bit more in the way of, of education on the part of the, the East Asian Tigers. So they were able to take advantage of that and then use that for, for growth in the future. Uh, and this is not happening at all in, in Latin America. And so that, that's of, of tremendous concern. And that was kind of the main point of that, of that study. Um, so not too many prospects in terms of trade with China. It's one fifteen. Do I have? Can I? When should I stop? One thirty. One thirty. Okay, so we can take another round. Joe Fu Smith, uh, Center for the Study of Asia. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Margaret because she started with the rebalancing of the Chinese economy. The mm -hmm. Uh, desired for consumption-driven growth. And then the whole conversation, as I've heard it, has all been about resource constraints, SOEs, major trade uh, with Latin America. And are these two subjects unrelated? Does the uh, consumption economy not have to grow, this rebalancing? If it does or doesn't happen, does this have anything at all? Mm -hmm. to do either with the Chinese economy as a whole or its impact on Latin America. Mm -hmm. Are these just disconnected from each other? Back here. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. So uh, it made me uh, recall my experience working for the, I mean, the 12th uh, five-year plan of China in my country uh, because I work at the provincial level. Uh, so, in fact, we are quite concerned with the situation, I mean, the current situation that China is in because we think China is uh, definitely a country in transition, both economically and socially. And, uh, in fact, uh, when we are facing uh, the 12th five year f of our country, we think there are more cons uncertainty than before because as I think at least three questions have to be answered. First, is this country uh, possible to transfer from a uh, uh, export oriented country to uh, uh, I mean internal demand uh, driven country or not uh, second whether the growth ro uh, the growth of the economic uh, the rate of the growth economic can translate it into the uh, growth of the income uh, uh, maybe expressed by the uh, per capita uh, income or not and thirdly we wonder whether this country can I mean, just as mentioned by uh, one of the presenters, that is, can we um, uh, escalate our industrial assistance? I mean, a lot of uh, uh, big uh, or state-owned companies are now in this uh, stage. That means to try to uh, get, get into the higher stage of their uh, manufacturing, to be moved into a higher stage of their value chain. So. Without, with all these uncertainties, in fact, it's very difficult to make a, a, a five-year plan with all the certainties. But finally, we can see all the outcomes here. And in fact, we still um, face all the challenges. So I think um, um, 
China is uh, experience, of course, uh, industrialization, but some parts of it may be in the deindustrialization stage, and also the urbanization is in its way. So my question is that whether do you think China do face some obstacles or most difficult part in its, uh, I mean, uh, realizing this five-year plan from your perspective? Because I think the perspective from yours and the perspective from us is quite different. So that's uh, my first question. And my second question is that, as you know, after 30 years of economic reform, so China now has seen a lot of uh, liberalization and also uh, privatization. So now, besides the um, state-owned enterprises, in fact, the small business are gaining its uh, power. So do you think the, there is some space for the cooperation between China and Latin America when the small business is concerned. Thank you. Mm. We'll take one more. Jim. Yes, this, let me uh, so sort of shift to maybe a par pardi, not deliberately so, but a pardi perspective. Which be, I heard Edward talk about longer range issues as you see them to do with sort of thresholds beyond which energy issues about access to uh, natural resources. And explain that out in other terms. We have a five-year plan. We know in the in in the in, in in Europe in the U.S. we have pushing towards shorter and shorter you know stock market relationships to economic planning to political decisions. Very difficult issue pushing us to the shorter and shorter term. Mm -hmm. For the U.S., five years would be a long time. Mm -hmm. That's into another administration. But you were talking in the much longer term, Edward, and I'm very interested in that perspective. And I wonder for all of you to think not in terms of policy or projected policy, but what are the issues in that longer term? The pricing of energy resources, the pricing of food commodities, the pricing of value-added uh, agricultural inputs, things of that nature mm -hmm. are going to be the longer term issue that really drives the directions. So I wonder if you can, you can each say something about your perspective on that. Uh, in terms of the, the five-year plan and, and uncertainty, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the, the uncertainties that I addressed in, when speaking actually came from, from Chinese articles. And I think, you know, I see quite a bit of, of um, common analysis in, in those terms I, between, you know, those, who, those American and Western scholars who are analyzing the 12 five-year plan. And, and Chinese scholars, particularly with, with regard to this idea of economic transformation, whether or not it's going to happen, uh, you know, constraints on on urbanization, on environmental issues. I, a number of the papers are written by co-authors that are Chinese and, and American, and so I see a lot of, of, of common ground there uh, in terms of you know concerns about the the ability to implement this plan. Um, with regard to the extent to which ec economic transformation is related at all to <laughs> to what we're talking about, especially to to natural resources, and and which is kind of the you know had, has been the driver of the relationship or the foundation of the China Latin America relationship, um, it's absolutely related. The the problem is that there are any number of uh, you know various scenarios that could play out, and so it's very difficult to in in a short period of time to kind of go through each and talk about each of them. But uh, I mean, let's say that. What I foresee happening, and I'm by no means, <laughs> you know, an expert or, or a soothsayer in this regard, but uh, what I see happening is China not being willing to implement the sorts of difficult financial reforms necessary to to really increase consumption as a share of GDP. I mean, consumption on its own has increased quite a bit, but consumption as a share of GDP, because there's tremendous political opposition uh, you know, at the very highest levels to doing this. Uh, they'll be able to strengthen their social safety net, but that's not the only issue, right? There's, the income issue is huge. Uh, these financial, financial repression, repression is a huge issue. And so without doing that, the only way they're going to be able to really continue generating growth is through fixed asset investment. They're going to continue doing that, right? But what they do have in their pocket, and it's, it's very clearly articulated in the five-year plan, are these industrialization and urbanization efforts, which are also linked to, or in the plan at least, they've very clearly described them as being 
promoting of, of higher rates of, of consumption because they provide more in the way of, of employment opportunity and increase incomes by transferring people from, from farms to urban areas, by uh, you know, providing higher salaries in, in, in cities and so on. So what I see is you know, that being the low-hanging fruit that, is, uh, that, that China reaches uh, for uh, during these five years. And that being said, uh, we're going to see a lot more in the way of, of you know, infrastructure development, a lot more in the way of rail, road. I mean, the numbers are incredible. And if you look at the, uh, at the five-year plan, they have, you know, in English, they have these sort of lists of, of the goals. And it's all investment driven. It's all investment driven, exactly. Yeah. It's all investment driven. And, and there's been no real indication that it's going to, to change. And yeah. because it's a very, very difficult change. And, uh, you know, and it requires a degree of political, cons political consensus that's not yet there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I see more investment-driven growth, specifically, you know, this sort of, we don't see it as much in the real estate sector now, uh, but they're going to be doing all of this low-income housing, so, because they've, they've put, you know, they've dampened, tried to dampen that intentionally. So, uh, so they're, they're going to boost it again with the low-income housing. It's an effort to kind of compensate for that. So, it's, it's interesting, and that means more in the way of imports of natural resources from Latin America, you know, uh, construction specific. Now, if China is successful, that's a whole, you know, in, in doing that, that's a whole other question. And, and, and Kevin and Edward had, have talked about this a little bit already. But, you know, if they achieve higher incomes and if they, uh, you know, have a larger middle class as a result, then, you know, you t there's the whole, there's a lot of talk about, you know, expanding palates in China and, uh, taste for new foods and people are eating more as they have higher incomes and so you know I, Latin America is an obvious destination for agricultural goods especially when you're not able to produce enough uh, domestically and increasingly I mean it's fascinating I, I, we, we follow all of the Spanish language news on, on China at the, at the dialogue and I see report after report of you know Chile, uh, Peru, all of these countries sending delegations over to China to advertise wine and grapes and all of these you know foods that have been consumed in China for years, but are increasingly popular. Um, chocolate, coffee, huge. I mean, just you, you see a, a real expansion, real diversification in terms of agriculture, and that would, if you know, incomes increase as a result of this economic transformation or many of the outline, uh, many of the guidelines in the plan, then. We'll see more of that as well. So it's all, you know, it's all up in the air, and there are implications for every, every scenario. I'll just answer the long run problem uh, concern. Is that if you take the the very long run, uh, China accentuates an existing concern that has been the the issue in Latin America over the long run, which is the concern of how to move away from commodity based growth, especially in, in South America. That's why some, you know, if you if you read the newspapers in places like Brazil, they blame China for their deindustrialization. But part, China, in a lot of ways, is the what do you say, the straw that it might be breaking the the camel's back, right? Is that these countries uh, have put too much faith uh, in in their in the short term and what they have a comparative advantage in now and right now the Latin the South Americans have a comparative advantage in all this stuff in the ground, mm -hmm. um, and now you've got a billion people that want it. And so it's accelerated growth. It's shortened, uh, uh, shortened supplies of these things on the planet. And so it's increased, uh, increased the prices. And, and there's a growth bonanza in the region. Uh, that's a long-term curse, the resource mm -hmm. curse or, or Dutch disease that, uh, that if, if it's not combated uh, over the long run, uh, w the region could have serious uh, long-run economic uh, concerns. And I, I say they should take an example from the China ch playbook because this is exactly what China debated 50 years ago, right? And China is the world success story of a country that moved away from commodity-based growth to diversified industrialization and now can build a better solar power plant than we can, have a uh, uh, corner of the market in, in wind farm, and uh, the, in two years they'll be selling cars in the United States thanks to the new plants that they have in Mexico. Uh, I think uh, I think we can the the region can learn a lot uh, from uh, how of how China has diversified its economy over the past fifty years to uh, to save itself from the long run path that it might be in. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll maybe comment also on that. Um, the so Nick Lardy just wrote a book on um, on sort of how he views this shift, uh, particularly in terms of access to finance, right? So the question of state access, is there some preferential, um, and there has been historically, you know, preferential access to capital by um, 
uh, state or enterprises, to what extent have, have SMEs, to your question, been locked out of that uh, capital? Um, and also the extent he has in there, the extent to which there really is any green shoots of transition from, from this production-based society to a consumption-based society. And it's actually quite good. I think it's, it's, it's very different. I mean, he's taking a pretty hard line on and a strong argument that he does see change, um, unlike other uh, China watchers who've said that, no, that we're seeing more of the same. So he actually sees there's a bit of a pivot. Um, so there's a big debate that's, I think, about to be unleashed among that, the community um, in terms of to what extent is China starting to come up against certain constraints, um, particularly in terms of the ability of its uh, state-owned system, uh, economic system, to be able to diversify and do it and do so in a competitive environment, right? Because that's the big difference. So, so a state or enterprise can create enormous amount of rents. Um, which is what they've done when they're operating in a de facto monopoly or pseudo monopoly, right? Whether it's a regional monopoly in the case of like, like electricity company uh, or a national monopoly when you look at even oil and gas, a huge industry like that where three quarters of the of the production is one company, right? So under those circumstances, you can create a lot of rent and you can create a lot of capital uh, and you can create a lot of retained earnings. Um, and what they're doing now, though, is they're trying to take a lot of that money off the table and put it out into the world. The question is, when you do that into the world, um, you then enter a very different, both political economy, as, as Kevin's saying, but also just a different competitive um, position uh, because you're a newcomer. So I think that's where we're starting to see real questions about to what extent does this China model, to the extent it is a model, uh, uh, can it be exported? And, and can it be exported uh, particularly into, de into the developing world where the industrial structure is quite different? Um, so I guess that leads me to, to say that in, in the long term, I'm, uh, I'm interested to see what's going to happen because I find that I'm baffled by the fact that one of the, the things I, one of the things I spend a lot of time thinking about is You'd think that with five-year plans and you'd think that with long-term patient state capital, you'd think that um, there would be a lot of risk tolerance, right, in that system, and particularly from the corporation perspective, that with negative return on capital, I mean, their, their capital you know, rates are, are almost negative, effectively, right? So very cheap capital, plus supposedly the sage philosopher kings, right, in terms of uh, their regulators and owners above them, where there's a lot of distance as well, that you would have uh, outlays of capital in risky areas because you don't have what you're saying, the quarterly return, short-termism, impatient capital of the West. But at least what I see is uh, time and time again, and we're, we're coming up with quantitative metrics to show this in terms of time to market of new technologies, even incremental innovation, let alone uh, ra radical innovation, is I do not see them making those being very risk tolerant, they're incredibly risk intolerant, right? And mostly because these standard enterprises are run by people who are highly political, right? And, and are, are are being um, they're being evaluated in very short term through the very short term lenses. And so, whether you're a consultant or a banker trying to sell them the new, bright new shiny toy, um, or you're the company trying to create the joint venture, saying here is the you 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 want to get involved because you want to move up the value chain, be involved in the last sort of almost the deployment phase, not even R&D early on, it's very difficult to get them to do so. And so I think that's what fascinates the hell out of me, is, is, why, is it so, why is it so impatient when the capital is so different, the politics are so different? Why don't we, Kevin, why don't we close it there? Yeah, can you just mention next week, because I forgot to. Before we say goodbye, we just want to invite you all back here. Uh, uh, <laughs> next, uh, next Thursday at 3 p.m., we're going to have another event like this to release a uh, task force report called Regulating Global Capital Flows for Long-Run Development. Uh, it'll be a panel with myself, unfortunately, again, for you, um, but also Jose Antonio Campo, the former finance minister of Colombia, and a woman named Eileen Grable from the University of Denver. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, speculative capital and the uh, capital flows in the wake of the financial crisis and the extent to which we need some sort of uh, global governance of these things for long-run development. Three o'clock here, you'll need to RSVP because, as you know, these things get packed. Sorry. Well, thank you. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to our panel. Thank yeah. you. Thanks.